you guys come from two very different backgrounds, but yet you, both your companies are sort of positioned in the same place, sort of opening a new conversation about how we take in news. Quickly, the short abridged version, how did you guys get here? So uh, I start, got into this industry accidentally. I was a grad student at the MIT Media Lab, and I was uh, procrastinating doing my master's thesis, and I ordered a pair of shoes from the Nike website, um, customized with the word sweatshop, because I wanted to see whether Nike would send me a pair of shoes that said sweatshop on the side. Um, <laughs> And they wrote back and said it was inappropriate slang, so I explained that it was, um, it means a shop or factory where workers toil under unhealthy conditions, it's in the dictionary. Anyway, they didn't send me the shoes, but this became an early email forward that reached millions of people. I ended up on the Today Show talking about it, even though I knew nothing about sweatshop labor, and it made me think, what is happening to the media world that someone who does some silly thing uh, can reach millions of people without owning a printing press, without owning a broadcast pipe, um, if people think something is worth sharing and passing on to their friends, um, you can reach a huge audience. And, and from there, I started Huffing and Post and, and, and now BuzzFeed. And you, you broke up with my mom crush, Ariana Huffington, to start <laughs> BuzzFeed, which I heard a little bit, but I like BuzzFeed. I appreciate that. No, no, no worries. <laughs> I can introduce you if you want. I met her last year. Okay, great. I got her number. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I like the segue. I was looking at an ad online, to, and then I started... Huffington Post. <laughs> yeah. Cut to. <laughs> How about you, Shane? We started a, a punk mag in Montreal um, a long time ago, nearly 20 years ago. And we came down to the States, and coming down from Montreal was kind of kind of coming down from Reykjavik. They were like, oh, cute, you know. And uh, we started <laughs> expanding around the world, and soon we were in 34 countries. And as we expanded, we kept saying, hey, there's all these economic problems, environmental problems, political problems somebody should do something about this. And I was, my wake up moment was I was, we were shooting something in Beijing and there was a two week traffic jam, not a two hour traffic jam or a two day traffic, a two week traffic jam. And I was like, you ha still have to make 4% more cars year after year, but there's a two week, obviously the system's broken, there's a two week traffic jam. Where are all the adults? Why isn't somebody saying something about this? And then I realized, oh, I have one of the biggest youth media platforms in the world, I should say something about it. And we started doing news and then when we started doing news it just blew up and our audience made us do more and more and more. Yeah, I remember when, as a kid, you know, growing up in skateboarding and snowboarding, you know, your magazine in the late 90s, early 2000s was very popular amongst a very small group of people because you told stories that were, people might have known something about, but then you literally told the rest of the story that was under the rock. And you became a cooler magazine than a lot of the music, surf mags or snowboard mags because we got the rest of the story from you guys. It brings me kind of to the next question. All you ever hear uh, in the news is that young people don't care. They don't want to be informed. They don't care about news. They don't care about the issues. Young people don't care. We can't reach them. So, you know, unless you're going to use a hologram to talk to Will I Am, like, people are not, young people don't care. You guys have completely dismissed that. Why is it that it's working for you with the kids? Uh, I mean, I think young people have never not been interested in news. I mean, we, we have 85 million unique visitors a month, over 50 million YouTube views a month. Um, the majority of them are, are 18 to 34, you know, most of our readers. Um, about half our traffic is on mobile devices. And so if you are on platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, mobile, that young people are already using, and you have compelling content, and you're telling good stories, you're informing people, um, there's no reason that, that young people wouldn't care about that. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's that you know, young people don't watch the evening news. The average age of people watching the evening news is you know, 60. Fox News is over 65. They can't even measure how old they are. Um, <laughs> and so like, uh, you know, that, expecting people to watch that, I think, is, is unrealistic. But, but thinking about um, the new platforms that young people are already using, there's a huge opportunity. Yeah, I think it, you know, if you really want to look at it and be honest, um, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, if you look at when Gen Y was sort of coming of age, was the invasion of Afghanistan and, and Iraq, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a sad day for the fourth estate, where major news media knew that, you know, anyone with half a brain knew that Saddam Hussein uh, was not helping Al-Qaeda, that they were uh, diametrically opposed because they were a secular regime. Uh, the whole weapons of mass destruction, uh, you know, which, which then came to light right after, um, and so Gen Y just turned off. 
and said, well, we're going to go here. We're going to look at blogs. We're going to look at HuffPo. We're going to look at, you know, we're going to actually talk to people who are in Iraq and say, what the hell's happening? And then what happened with companies like BuzzFeed is that you have young people just saying, okay, I'm going to go here because I actually trust what these people are saying because these people have already lied to me. Would you say that in mainstream news that authenticity is, for the most part, non-existent? Well, I think that, you know, there's this whole debate between subjectivity and objectivity, and I think that being a guy from, you know, take your pick, NYU journalism school, getting his press uh, 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 body armor and embedding with the Marines, and then going into somewhere like Afghanistan, obviously you're not going to, you know, piss on the Marines because they're saving your life every day. You are going to be uh, subjective. You're not going to, you're not going to say Osama bin Laden is a good guy. You know, when, when you go to a lot of these countries, Osama bin Laden's a hero. And so obviously they're not going to go there and write that. So that then this whole objectivity versus subjectivity thing becomes moot. And I think for us, what we started doing is approach it from the documentary filmmaking uh, point of view rather than, you know, there's a fire at City Hall, Johnny, go get a photo. We're like, well, we're going to go to Afghanistan, we're going to press record, and we're going to let the story unfold and let the people who are actually there tell that story and then put it together in the edit suite so you have a lot more freedom in, 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 in that format. And I think if you try to shoehorn a story in, then you run into the problems that mainstream media are in right now. So when you go to a North Korea or an Afghanistan, what you're saying is you don't go there with, like, this is the story we're going after. The story is never the story you think it's going to be, ever. And that's always been true. I mean, I think, I think good journalists find, find the beginnings of a story, and they dig, and they, they often go to great lengths and bend the rules to get information. Woodward and Bernstein did a lot of things that were, you know, sketchy that, you know, the public editor would have written a note saying that you shouldn't do that. But they wanted to get the story above all else, and they, and they succeeded in doing that. And I think that what you're seeing now is that, is, is that the, there's a new crop of, of, of journalistic organizations that, that are cropping up online that are, are going after things that the mainstream media doesn't always want to touch. So what does that mean for the mainstream media? <laughs> well, 65-year-old people will soon be 75. I mean, McDonald's. <laughs> And dolphins talk, and rainbows. If you want to talk marketing, McDonald's gets you know, people when they're kids because then they have them for a long time. Dove wants to do products for life. I mean, what's happened is they've aged up to the point where they're screwed. And, and you can't reverse engineer it. You can't say, oh, well, let's, let's, let's get the young, well, let's get the Gen Y, we'll put a skateboard in it or whatever it is. You, you know, it, 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 when, and everyone says authentic. You know, authentic isn't a word you can dream up in a, in a boardroom. If, if young people aren't shooting it, if young people aren't cutting it, if young people aren't presenting it, they will be smelled out. And we always say this, you know, they've been marketed to since they were children because cartoons are made to sell cereals. So they have the most sophisticated bullshit detectors on earth. And the only way to get around those bullshit detectors is to not bullshit. And so, that, you know, that's it. I think there's, there's two possibilities for the main, mainstream media. One is that, is that their audience just keeps getting older and they still read print newspapers and still watch the same kind of television shows they've always watched. The other is that those people, older people start jumping to Facebook and to Twitter and, and embracing the social web and there's an expansion of use of these tools and, and there's a shift of those people to, you know, like I don't know whether BuzzFeed's demographic will get older because more people will embrace the social web and more people will embrace our style of, 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 of doing news and entertainment. Um, or whether, whether we'll, we'll just keep the cohort we have and, and grow. Mm. But the, the possibilities are either that people will, will keep the media that they grew up with and stay with that, or that they'll jump to, to the social web. It's not gonna, gonna, gonna be, uh, you know, kids are not gonna subscribe to print newspapers ever. Ever. It's a wrap. 23 year olds are not, gonna, are not gonna subscribe to a print newspaper. That's the truth. I also <laughs> think they can't compete with the scale. I mean, if you look at what YouTube is doing and the, the scale that they have, I mean, if you look at the, the, the Dove numbers or BuzzFeed's numbers, I mean, if you're saying, well, we're going to do, um, you know, a billion video views on news or what, what, what have you, then you say, okay, that's not CNN, that's 10x CNN. So, you know, if you're looking at on the scale side, digital is the future, nothing can compete with it. Which brings me to your Emmy nomination. <laughs> we didn't win. 
hey, but the nomination is kind of the win. Yeah, I mean, we were stoked because we're, I, I believe we're the first sort of online news program to, to then sort of go on to TV and then, you know, get that kind of recognition and stuff, which we're incredibly stoked uh, to do. Um, but one of the things that we, that I always say is, look, the internet is better than TV. It's a, it's a, it's a better platform. It does more. It's just better. The problem is, is the content isn't as good as TV. It's catching up, but it, it just traditionally hasn't been as good. And our challenge was be better or be as good as TV or more better than TV. And you know, the, when we first started in 2006, the first thing we made was a film called Heavy Metal in Baghdad. And at the time, sort of online content was crap and TV was less crap. And then there was, ah, ah you know, the holy grail of film. And we went straight from online to, to film. And that was our sort of, you know, coming out of the pond moment. And we said, oh, well, we're going to make high quality stuff. So when we started making news, everyone looks down their nose at you and says, oh, these kids, these stunt journalists or whatever they are. And then, you know, we put out the show on HBO and, and, and our first season got an Emmy nod, which is great because it's actually saying, well, we're online, we're an online company, but yet we can make the gold standard of, of news content. How has the, the HBO success sort of affected your overall brand? There's a lot of people who watch the AB, HBO show, and that's the first time they learned that there was ever this thing called Vice. Well, it's growing exponentially. It, 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 it brought us to a bigger audience, but I mean, we're much bigger on YouTube, for example, than we are on HBO. Um, we're much more concerned with, with what we do on YouTube than we are with HBO. HBO, for us, is a, is a fantastic vehicle for for what we do in a very small sort of uh, uh, spectrum, but HBO, or sorry, on, on YouTube, we do everything, and, and we're much bigger on, on, on YouTube. I mean, we're, you know, half billion video views, five, five million subs. It's, a, it's just a bigger piece of our business. Yeah, for, for us, we haven't, we haven't done um, television shows or films or things like that, that and, we, and we don't plan to, but there is a legitimizing effect of, you know, some of our hires, you know, where Miriam Elder from The Guardian joins to be our foreign editor, or Lisa Tazi runs our news desk from the, who came from The New York Times. And I don't think there needs to be that. I think that, that a lot of the most talented people who, who, who work at BuzzFeed learn from, you know, loving the web and learning how to become journalists and being mentored by our team. Um, but, but I think people are starting to realize, oh, the digital is, is, the, is, is the future. Social and mobile are the future. And there's going to be real investments in quality. We're hiring investigative journalists. We're, we're continuing to increase the level of quality. Vice is making TV quality stuff on the web um, and on television. And, and that's something that you're just going to see more and more of, where things can be, can be uh, released on digital platforms and be just as good as what the traditional media did, can inform the public, can entertain the public just as much. So it's not a, a, a scary thing happening. It's actually an exciting thing that shift is happening. Unless you're in television. <laughs> well, I think, I think if you look at it, you know what? The, the most exciting hire that we had is a little kid named Tim Poole who became famous for um, uh, Occupy Wall Street and, 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 and all that coverage. And um, he actually took uh, Google Glass um, and went to uh, Turkey and Cairo and uh, just went there, uh, he was, I believe, the first, I think it was written about, he was the first, and he went and just literally just walked around, and so you could go and live stream and see, so everyone's saying, well, this is happening in Turkey, or this is happening in, 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 in Egypt, in Cairo, and he, and he would just be there, and you could see it, you could see everything in real time, and when I was watching that, that's, you wanna talk about inspiration, I'm like, that just changed news, because anyone can say whatever the hell they want, right-wing politics, left-wing politics, centrist, whatever they want to do. Any government can say whatever they want. But when you have thousands and thousands of kids who are on the street just saying, well, this is what I'm actually seeing, it's game over. So would you say that the future of news will, will look like a sort of organized collection of crowdsourced news? So during the Boston bombings, we had two reporters on the ground. And we also had a team in New York that understood how Twitter worked, how Instagram worked. The best raw source of information was things like, like Instagram. People would say, there's a confrontation happening outside my house, and here's the picture of it. Yet, sources that were pure digital sources also had wrong information. And so it's going to be hybrid, where, where the best reporting organizations are going to understand the web and this raw feed of information. 
but they're also going to do traditional reporting, go interview people, they're going to verify sources, they're going to, they're going to do both of those things. And that's why we were able to, we were the first news organization to identify suspect number two's Twitter account, because we looked who he followed, we noticed the avatar didn't match what was in the news report, so it was probably earlier. We found that people following him went to the same high school, and we were able to get them on the record and authenticate the account. It required understanding how the web worked, and understanding how Twitter works, and it required having good reporters, and those two together are pretty powerful. When you have a, a moment like that, and, and then on the back end of it, what's it like to realize, like, oh, this, this is what it's coming to? I mean, I think it's you sort of do it as you go, you know, and don't, I mean, we're just running and not necessarily philosophizing about it too much. But it's, it, you know, we, we just, we just, you know, a lot of these things are new and you're sort of saying, okay, we're, we're seeing that, that people are live tweeting the, tel the police scanner. You know, police scanners aren't always right. Um, and, you know, Reddit had a problem where they identified the wrong suspect and it was a real problem for their family and for, you know, the wrong information got out. Law enforcement will give wrong information and, you know, the, the, a, a policeman will tell CNN or something and then if CNN reports it, it gets, it gets, you know, spread all across Twitter instantly. And so I think with the news industry, we're realizing now that you, the public is going to see under the curtain more. Stuff's happening online and in a very public way, but you still need to have great reporting and to, 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 to figure out what's real and what's not. Perfect balance. What quickly do the future of both your brands look like moving forward? Well, we're launching a, a, a global news network in 18 countries, 18 languages with, uh, with YouTube uh, in Q1. Um, so news is going to be huge for us. We're, uh, we're also doing that. <laughs> uh, we're going to continue uh, launching in, in, in our verticals in all our different countries, so more channels. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to make a lot of money. Yeah, we'll make some too. You'll make more. <laughs> Well, I look and we're going to merge because us yeah, together, yeah, you can compete with us. And everyone in this room will be like, "I was there. I was there." When <laughs> it happened. Jonah and Shane, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.